Kip, what's up, man? Good to see you. We get looks like we got our uniform on today. You got the hat, you yeah, got a black we got shirt. The, we're like different color, styles, color schemed. Yeah, that's right. This is the uniform of Order of Man, just so you guys know. If you ever have any questions, um, let those questions be put to rest. Yeah, check us on YouTube if you know if you need assistance on how to oh, dress. Oh, but you don't have the right drink though. That's wrong. I know. That's the well, wrong part of the uniform. And, and once I said that, I was immediately like, Tanner would not approve of our t-shirts. Yeah, but Tanner wears <laughs> leopard print suede t-shirts or button-up shirts. So no, he's 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 got it locked in like eighty-eight percent of the time. The other twelve, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. But that's well, different. I've got it unlocked twelve percent of the time, and the other eighty-eight percent of the time, I look like this. <laughs> yeah, Tanner's uh, pushing the envelope a little well, bit. That's his the, job, yeah. right? That's he's his job. he's immersed. He's in the deal. By the way, no, truly though, I've seen the guys that he's worked with, and and he's worked with me a little bit. Obviously, I have not taken it totally to heart, uh, but when I do, I look pretty good. But yeah. not today. <laughs> <laughs> So don't, don't watch this Tanner. Just, just listen. Yeah. That's it. Just, just listen. Yeah. I'm still dealing with some issues. I'm, I got, I think what's I your, might have hurt myself again. What's your, <laughs> what's your update? I have a partially ruptured pectoral tendon. That's the, so I'm going to have surgery hey, probably me, in two or three weeks. And then I'm so going to, I, th- I think I'm, I mean, why wouldn't I get surgery? I'm young. I'm active. I'm going to be out for several months, but why wouldn't I do that? It's mechanically it's compromised. Uh, it's, you know, I've got a little bit of, uh, a lot, a lot, it's a lot weaker. And so I'm going to be active. So just go get the dang surgery and get it done. And my goal is to be ready to go for immersion camp in the end of August. Got it. So the tear is big enough that, that they're recommending surgery. It's not like a small partial. Yeah. Yeah. It's sorry, man. Enough. That sucks. I did it to myself just being done. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was, I, I was just being dumb and I knew be- that's the best way to say it. I knew, knew better, better and yeah. I still did it. And I created a problem for myself. Isn't that life? We know better yeah. and we still make poor decisions and then we <laughs> suffer the consequences. And that's what I'm dealing with right yeah. now. And next time that opportunity comes up in your mind, you'll go, uh, you know what? Not this time. Not this time. I don't know. I'm pretty dense. I might do it again. <laughs> now that you have a bionic peck after that's your right. surgery. Yeah. Right. Can you just You're put like- a metal plate of some sort in there so I can do this with three or yeah. four times the, the power and speed. Ryan's like, you know, if you could uh, put a little bit of CCs on that side, you know, get a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, oh, what was the show? Rookie of the year. You remember that? And the kid like breaks his arm and uh-uh. attendance or whatever. You don't remember that show? No. Rookie Look, of the year. Freight something. Roll, Henry Roland Gardner. Oh, come on, bro. How come old is this now. movie? Well, you're old, old, you? substantially how, older than I no, am. So. How old are you? <laughs> How old are you? I'm older than you. I, I'm 40. You're older than me. I'm 41. So okay. maybe it's a little behind your time, but rookie of the year, go watch it with your kids. The okay. guy's a kid, his arm ends up healing like too tight. He like tears his arm or tears a muscle or a tendon and heals too tight. And then he ends up going to play, I think for the Cubs. Oh yeah. And he's, and he's like 14 super, or 13. Yeah. Or something. Like he's a young yeah. kid with a, a wicked yeah, arm. Man. Yeah. Henry Roland Gardner. Come on now. <laughs> All right, now, let's get into some out, questions. If you threw out Sandlot, I would have been able to reference, but uh, Rookie of the Year, you know, I'll work on it. Yeah, Sandlot's too, like, everybody knows that. I'm trying to go for these, like, little fringe things that only the best <laughs> know about. All right, we're fielding questions from the Foundry uh, and from the Iron Council, actually. Uh, to learn more about the IC, I, I'm, a, I'm hesitant to throw out web URLs. I guess if Doesn't someone work. watches this at one point. All right. Let me, okay, let me say, let me complain a little bit more before I get into questions. And there is a lesson here, guys. So two weeks ago, two weeks ago, my website crashed. A lot of you guys have tried to get on the website and have messaged me and I appreciate the concern. I know, I know it's down. Okay. Trust me. I know it's impacted me more than it's impacted you. I know Uh, we're working on it, but essentially long story short, the servers that they were hosted on were, were attacked. Um, there's some ransomware and stuff happening and, and authorities are involved with it to like try to figure out who did this. Thousands of websites have been impacted. 
Um, so right now I can't even get access to my backups for the website, which if I could, I would just build another website, restore the backups. We'd be good to go, but I can't. So we're working on that. So that's crappy. Uh, and then I get an email from my previous publisher for that book over your left shoulder. And they said that they cannot pay me royalties for, from, I think if I remember, it's either quarter one or quarter two through quarter two of this year. So a year of royalties, I cannot be paid on. Uh, on printed book sales, which are significant, probably more in the last year than I've ever sold before. Does it logically like, make sense to you? Why not? Like, are you their reasoning for that? I understand what's happening. I'm not happy about it. I'm okay. capable of understanding what's going on. Yeah. I don't, I'm not happy about it, of course, but also you know, we've been kicked in the dick a couple of times on some pretty big things over the past two weeks. And I think five years ago, I would have blown a gasket. And now I'm kind of like, you know, it's going to work out, especially with a book. I'm after all this said and done, I will, I will own all the rights to that book, a hundred percent of the rights to that book, which is awesome. That's great. I, I own all of it and the rights to it. And I don't now I own, right. There's a split there. And a, and a distribution model. So I'm thinking to myself, as Jocko would say, is good because now I can take that and I can either publish it for myself exclusively, or I can go to my current publisher for my next mm. book and sell it, sell the rights to them, sell the rights to another publisher or organization. So there's there's some opportunities here. But the point I'm making, guys, is that yeah, you're gonna get beat up, you're gonna get kicked, you're gonna get you know banged up now and again. And if you freak out about it, you're only gonna make it worse. If you roll with it. And I'm not saying be passive, I'm not being passive, but if you roll yeah. with it in an assertive way, you're going to come out not unscathed, but more capable of dealing with hardship down the road. So yeah, yeah we're dealing with a couple of things and it's all good guys. Like we're going to get it figured out. And in the meantime, I just appreciate all the support. And also I realized, man, we actually did some things pretty good. Like with the iron council and the store, they're not hooked up to my website by design. And now I'm looking at it because I've talked to some people who everything's funneled through their website. And I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue turned off. The faucet turned off overnight. That yeah. hasn't been the case with us. So I'm very, very fortunate that way. Yeah. And the store is still up and running, correct? Store is still good. Yeah. So you can um, go to store.orderofman.com, even yeah. though the website's not up. Yeah. Store is still good. Um, the book is still being printed. Um Iron Council will still open up. I'll need to change a few links here and there, but it's not like yeah. it went away. Like we just need to change the links. But other than that, we're we're solid, man. We're we're sitting pretty good. Copy. Okay. Well, we'll fill in questions from the IC to join us in the IC. Connect with Ryan Mickler on Instagram. So then that way you guys can get notified when that opens up. We're going to open that up roughly around the 15th of June. Um, and that will be open for two weeks. So your window is coming up and you need to take advantage of it. We're talking about this before we hit record, the importance of acting on opportunities that present themselves, right? And just executing when opportunities present, because if we wait for things to align to be perfect, seldom will that ever be the case and, and opportunities will pass you by. So don't pass by joining us in the Iron Council. Yeah, I've right. seen guys pass up a lot of great opportunities because they're not quote unquote ready. And you don't need to be ready. You need to be willing. Yeah. So if your boss comes to you and says, hey, would you like a promotion? Like who in their right mind would say no? But you'd be People surprised do, because yeah. in that and other facets of life, guys are like, oh, I'm not ready for that. It's like, oh my goodness. Or a client comes to you and says, hey, do you know, let's say you're a, a web development company. And they're like, hey, do you know this specific kind of code? The answer is not no. Come on now. The answer is, oh yes, we can definitely do that for you. And then you figure it out, right? You hire somebody, you bring somebody on, you watch a bunch of videos, you get some consulting and coaching, but you figure it out to provide the solutions. But if you're like, no, sorry, we don't do that. Like I had an accounting company that I'm, I'm trying to start working with for some taxes. And I'm like, hey, do you guys do payroll services? They're like, no, we, we send them over there. So I reached out to the other payroll services. Guess what the other payroll services company does? Taxes. <laughs> Boom. What an idiot. What an idiot. Like yeah. you can't bring on one or two people to manage payroll. You're going to send me to somewhere else that does taxes. Cool. I'll do my taxes over there. They do it all in house. 
I mean, come on now, guys. Like we can do better than this. We should yeah. do better than this. Well, and some of it's about service, right? We we ended up doing a large streaming service for um, like a very large credit credit union, and they and to think through this, there's a lot of uh, legality that comes with it when they vote in board members. And so, if you're streaming the board meeting and all of a sudden the people can't vote, you got a legal issue on your hands, right? Mm, so, so this yeah. system cannot not work, right? It can't fail. It would be a disaster. And programmatically, we address the ability for members to log in, to watch the live stream and to vote on candidates all online. Mm -hmm. But what don't we do? Streaming. I, I, I don't know streaming hardware and software. That, that's not our expertise. But that was highly inconvenient for us to go throw our hands up to the client and go, oh, well, you know, we could program everything else, but how you stream uh, that's you on know, you they, that find someone else. And so instead we're like, so I called up a buddy that does concerts or whatever and said, Hey, who do you guys use for concerts? I need a phone number. Got that phone number, called that guy up and say, here's the scenario. I need the right equipment, like the top of the line equipment. What would you use? And he's like, black magic, a 10, this is what you need. You need to switch. I ordered two of them, brought them to the office within a week. Here we are streaming, you know, on these switchboards, learning on how to do this. Why? Because that's what the client needed. So exactly. it wasn't just us like, oh, we want to make money. No, we're trying to provide the best service possible. And that includes us understanding maybe areas that we have gaps of understanding. So that way we can simplify the process for a client. But let's not dismiss making money either. No, no. But you know what I'm saying? I'm not like I smoke do. and mirrors like, oh, we could do that. And we're like, no, no, we don't. no it's I like, know no, let's do what's best. Right. And I, because I know you, I know what you're saying, but I also know that there's going to be people listening to this and they're, and they're, they're kind of thinking the same thing, but that's because people have a bad relationship with money. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah. well, we don't want to make money doing it. Cause well, why, why, why don't, if like, I don't figure it out, they have to. Yeah. Now there's another, sir, somebody's going to offer it. It might as well be you. You can like, if you believe in yourself enough, it might as well be you. And so yeah, figure out the streaming platform. And now you have one more service to offer and that could generate an additional six, seven figures of, of revenue to the organization just because you spent a little time going out of the way for a client that you actually wanted to serve. Check it out. Totally. Speaking of uh, ATEM, check this out. You ready? Yeah. Blink. Oh, snap. Whoa, look at camera this. Angle. <laughs> camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. And I totally know what you're doing. Look at me. You do. Yeah. You do. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so we're working. We're working our magic over here as well. All right, man. What's uh? I don't. Have we even got to a question? No, no. But we have, right, we let's provided get to a excellent content nonetheless. All right. All right. <laughs> let's get to a question. John Preston. I struggle with after uh, AARs after action reviews, especially when it comes to a monthly assigned reading. How do you perform AARs when reading a book? Yeah. I mean, this is one I get a lot about how do you, cause a lot of guys are like, I'm going to read 50 books this year. I'm like, Whoa, tiger, like read 10, <laughs> read five, like pick the five best books. That's a little different in the iron council. Cause there's a minimum of one book per month. And even still, I would tell iron council guys, I'm like, Hey man, if that book doesn't resonate with you or you're reading something else, don't read the book. That's just an ancillary part of the process. Still go through the monthly assignment, still have the discussions, but maybe the book is something you forego because you read another book or you don't want to get overwhelmed down on something on. higher priority yeah. too, right? Yeah. Come on. So, um, be very careful on reading too much. I used to be a consumption zombie. And so I would just consume, 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 consume. Yeah. And then I realized, man, I'm inundated and overwhelmed with consumption that I'm never able to step into the role of production. So when you're reading a book, what I like to do is I will read a book and I never read a book without having a highlighter and a pen near me. And then what I do is the, as I read the book and I don't place false expectations. Like I'm going to read 17 chapters at chapters tonight. I'm like, I'm just going to read tonight for like a half an hour. I'm just going to read. And then I'll get my, my highlighter out. I'll get my pen out. And if I see something that really resonates with me, I do a little dog ear on that page itself. And then I highlight that sentence or that paragraph and if there's one little additional thought or note or question I have, I'll write in the margin that question or that thought where I highlight it. And so I'll do that throughout an entire book. Now, some people are cringing because they're like, don't write in books. I'm like, it's not really? like, oh, I've heard that. that a lot. Like, don't, don't write in books, don't dog ear. And to me, I'm like, 
okay, we don't live in the 1400s. It's not like some person needs to go and switch out all the little tiles to print a book anymore. If I want a fresh copy of a book, I can jump on Amazon and I can wait 20 hours and I can have that brand new book in my hands. But that's a book. Like I'm going to write in it. I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to mark it up. I'm going to tag it. So I'll do that. And then when I'm done with the book itself, I will actually go through and I'll read all of the dog-eared pages. So when I'm quote unquote done with a book, I'm not actually done with it. I go back and I read just the dog ears and then I figure out how I'm going to incorporate one or two specific things into a daily practice into my life. So if I read a self-development book on, let's say I read something by James Clear with Atomic Habits. I'm going to think to myself, oh, well, that's an interesting habit I hadn't considered before. So maybe what I'm going to do is every day for the next 90 days, I'm going to incorporate this planning system into my morning or evening routine. And then I do it for 90 days. And at the end of the 90 days, then I determine, is this something that was beneficial and value add for me? Or is it something that was just work and it really didn't improve or enhance my life at all? If it added to my life, I'm going to keep doing it. If it didn't add to my life or the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, I'm going to nix it because in that time, I've read other books that I can incorporate into my life as well. So that's how I personally do the after action review. It's not sitting down saying like, what did I learn? What did I take away? No, it's going back, looking at the highlights, looking at the tabs and the dog ears and the notes, and then coming up with and formulating a strategy that I can implement for 90 days. Got it. All right, Bobby, good old Bobby from the, the IC. Who has influenced the two of you the most and do they still? Hmm, man, lots of people. Well, I mean, the, the one that comes to mind the most, actually the two people to come to mind the most are, are women, my mother and my wife. Hmm. Those two people have influenced me, I think, more than anybody else. I made a comment on Instagram about the fact that men need to be raised by men. They need to learn from other men. They need to be around other men. And I got a mixed reaction on that. As with anything, everybody's so charged and polarized. Um, and none of that was meant to be a slight against women or even single mothers. My mother raised me primarily and my sister on her own. So it wasn't a slight towards her at all. Uh, in fact, like I just said, one of the most influential people in my life. But still, there was something missing in that equation. And she knew there was. And so she got me involved with other coaches and mentors and she got me in scouts and football and baseball, but even still, she was the most influential person in my life and still very influential. Um, my wife, when I look at her and I see everything that she does, she's a homemaker and a stay at home mom when she raises the kids and how she communicates and how she loves us and the work that she does and how hardworking she is and how compassionate, empathetic there's a lot for me to be learned because I don't naturally gravitate towards those characteristics. So yeah. I learn and it rounds me out in a, in a very meaningful way. You know, now that said, there's a lot of other mentors that I have. Uh, Pete Roberts is somebody who's very influential in my life. Um, Bedros Koulian, Ray Cash Care. Both of those guys were here at my property this past weekend. You know, the thing that I really thought highly of with Ray, uh, with Bedros is we invited him and his team over for dinner uh, the evening before the event. And it was, it was him and his team, but two of the guys that came out were volunteer. They had gone through one of his other programs before. Got it. And as one of them came, he brought, he had gone to the store and he brought a pie and he brought a pie for us. The other one uh, came and he got this little house plants, like a little, uh, little cactus house plant and he got it and he gave it to my wife. And then Bedros, when he came, he had a nice, really beautiful bouquet of flowers that he gave to my wife. And that to me spoke more highly of his financial success, his business acumen, his ability to lead men. And he has all of those things, trust me. But that little moment to me, I was like, man. And I told him that the next day. I pulled him aside. I'm like, hey, I wanted to tell. And I told him what I'm telling you right now. Like it spoke so highly of him and how he cares and how he shows up and how he presents himself and how he makes sure people feel gratitude for what they give to him. I, it, was, it was just a really touching moment that really stood out to me. So I have a lot of people. The most influential, 
my mother, my wife, but then there's a million, I could talk about all these guys like Jocko and Pete and Bedros and Ray and you. And I mean, everybody I get to talk with, I learn from everybody. As you get older, Ryan, does that, does it seem like it gets spread out more and more for you? Like, how do you feel like, I feel like if this question was posed to me, even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it would, the amount of people would be less and more weight would be on a single person, right? Where I'd be like, oh, this individual influences me the most. But as I get older, I get less influence from a single individual, but I get more influence from more people. And I think it's just through maturity that we realize that, you know, and I'm not saying this about Bedros, but I'll use him as an example. It's like, Bedros is amazing in these ways. As you get older, you realize what are the ways by which he's more amazing than not, you know, and, and I think For we sure. have a tendency to not put people on pedestals as we get older and we kind of pick and choose how these people influence, influence us versus having this naive opinion that this one single person is amazing in all areas of their life. Well, I think part of the reason is that we've been let down in life by so many different Mm -hmm. people. And a lot of the times, actually, every time you're let down, it's somebody that you held to an expectation, a standard every time, because if you didn't hold them to some objective standard, or I should say subjective standard, then you wouldn't have been let down. Yeah, totally. So everybody that you've ever been let down in your life by is somebody that you've had up here. And then they did or said something or didn't do something that pulled them down off of that pedestal, like you said, to, to something lower than what you had thought of before. So, and I think it is a maturity thing. You said that as I've gotten older, because I've, I've had so many people let me down and miss, miss my, this is a better way to say it is miss their expectation that I had of them. Like they didn't deliberately let me down, but they missed the mark, but that mark was mine. I'm the one who created that mark. And what I've done as I've gotten older is I've reduced my expectations and the standards of other people and increased my own. I've definitely increased my own expectation of my own performance, but reduced my expectation of others, unless there's some sort of agreement. Like Kip, if you say you're going to be here at 11 and you're not here at 11, okay, well, that's an agreement we had. I'm going to hold you to that. Yeah. And if you do it enough, I'm just not going to work with you anymore. Yeah. Right. So, but for other people, It's like, I don't put a bunch of false expectations on people and it's been liberating for me. And that way, when somebody does something like Bedros brings flowers to my wife, I'm like, oh, I didn't expect that. And he exceeds the expectation. And then I learn in that moment, oh, there's something to be learned there. But there's even people who I don't like uh, or people that I've had issue with in the past where they do something and I'm like, because I have zero expectation of it. I think to myself, man, that was actually pretty good. And I can look at it objectively and extract because I do a lot of good stuff and I do a lot of really horrible stuff personally. And so I would expect that other people would say, okay, well, Ryan got that right. He didn't get that right. It's not that he's an evil person, but it's also not that he's a saint. Yeah. It's just that he's a human being and he's really good in these aspects. And I'm going to glean information and pull that and pull this and what he does like that. No, I, I don't want that. (laughs) And and you leave that alone, but there's also good in everybody. I remember when I was really little, I think I've shared this story before. I was at a, an elementary school assembly and there was this girl that got up and she was doing a recital. I can't remember. It was a music recital. Maybe it was piano or violin or something. I can't really remember. And, but I don't know why this even sticks out with me. I remember thinking, man, she is really ugly. Like as a kid, I was like, oh, she's ugly. She's gross. That's what I thought in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then she started playing this beautiful musical piece. And as a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. And I felt maybe the reason I remember it is because I felt so horrible and guilty about the way that I had judged her about being ugly when actually she was like, it was beautiful and her skill set and her talent and her discipline to be able to play that beautiful musical piece. It just, it really stung me that I would judge a person like that and then be completely off the mark. And I think we could do, I'll do a better job at that. Like looking at somebody and saying, yeah, that, that was not good. 
but that was good. And so I'm going to learn from that. And I'm not going to learn from that. Totally. Totally. One of the most influential things that my mom probably ever did with us kids when we're little, um, there's a, there's a small lake, a little North of central Utah called Palisade, Lake Palisade. And I wish I knew the guy's name, but this guy, he adopted like, like maybe a hundred of, um, mentally handicapped kids. Mm. And, and he would reserve Palisade national park where this lake is. And every year they had had like this massive reunion of all these mentally handicapped kids. And my mom would sign us up to go up there every single year and help. And I remember as a kid doing kind of what you did a little bit, like, oh, they're weird and, and they're, mm -hmm. they're too in my face and, you know, like they don't know these social cues and what I just mm -hmm. it made me uncomfortable. And, and then I, through that experience, I, you know, I learned their innocence and how loving they were and, and thoughtful and just they're just children in big bodies. You know what they I mean? Are. And, yeah. um, it was such a, a breakthrough in judgment on anybody. It, it really like broke down that, that natural judgment I'd put on people and, and really accept people for who they were, regardless of the way they looked or acted, you know, it was one of the, one of the better things that my mom ever did uh, for us kids. But and yeah, it kind of remind me of your judgmental moment with the girl playing piano. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have some, I mean, my mother, she's always been so compassionate and caring and, uh, she was, she has her teaching certificate. So a lot of people think I hate school teachers because of the way I talk my mom's, she's an educator. Well, she, she works in the hospital system, but she has her teaching certificate. She worked in education for a lot of the years. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not the evil, horrible bastard. A lot of people think I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you're more it, evil for uh, demonizing your mom at the same yeah. time. <laughs> no, I, I don't, I don't, I actually don't have issue with the majority, the overwhelming amount of school teachers out there. I take issue with the system. I've never once came at any school teacher who's trying to do right by their children at all. Regardless, she worked in special ed for a long time. And she had this one young man uh, who was, uh, he was autistic. I believe he was autistic. And it was really hard, man, like to, to, because the social cues are not there and it's weird and it's awkward. And yeah. I did the same thing. And then I realized, oh my gosh, just like my mom, she saw all this beauty and love and intelligence and innocence and desire to serve and to be valuable in this young man. It's really cool. There's a, actually a really good show. My wife and I started watching on, uh, or uh, what is it called? It's called, um, love on the spectrum. So every once in a while, I'm just like, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm like, I don't want to read. I don't, I want to, I want to watch a show. And so we pulled up the show and I thought it was going to be like a, like a stupid, like dating show. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So where I could just get lost, but we started watching the show and it's amazing. Like, it's a really good show. Actually. It's, it's people on the spectrum trying to figure out and navigate dating. Some of them have never dated before and they're trying to find a partner and there's highs and there's lows and there's being rejected mm -hmm. and there's going on second dates. And it's like, like, you start to see with, with these people, like how special they actually are. It's really, really yeah. incredible. Really Spectrum incredible. as in autism, autism. Yeah. Okay. Me um, mental or learning disorders. That's the spectrum okay. we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Not like gender spectrum, but yeah, <laughs> but autism, learning disorders, mental yeah. disorders. They should do a show just like that of like you know, people that are on the spectrum of just being assholes and how dating goes for them. You know, the asshole spectrum. I could, I could, I could thrive really well on, <laughs> you that, could show. Be on that show. I would win that show. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't get any dates, but I would definitely win the show. <laughs> All right. What else? Uh, All right. Brett Huber. Thanks for what you guys are doing. What are your thoughts about the podcast with Cam Haynes? We talk a lot about our visions and our objectives and moving towards things daily. Haynes is a beast, no shade at him at all. But at one point he said he honestly didn't know what was next or what he was going to do next week. I'm interested in your reaction to that. Was he being humble, et cetera? Yeah, I think the way that you read it is the way a lot of people read it, but I actually read it differently than the way that you're saying it. And I'll explain, I don't know what's going to happen next week either. 
and neither do you, Kip. Yeah. And neither was a Brett. A Brett, yeah. And neither does Brett. Like now, if you have a race coming up, then I know, like I have a hunt coming up in two weeks. Okay. I know in two weeks I'm going to be hunting. Like I know that. Yeah. But for the most part, I don't know what life's going to deal me in, in any given moment. I, I don't know. And I think that's what Cam was saying. Is more about living in the present and right. dealing with what life gives you right. than trying to force, force your expectations on it. Right. Because Cam has goals. Clearly he has objectives. Like clearly he wants to be a great hunter. Clearly he cares about his family. Um, yeah. We talked in that interview about the Moab 240, a 240 mile race. Clearly that was a goal of his and clearly he prepared for it. Had some so, training for it. Yeah. Right. So let, let, I don't think we should read it as he isn't aspirational. He, he definitely is aspirational. And then I, the way that I interpreted that was that he's aspirational and then he does what he needs to do and he just lets the chips fall where they may. So yeah. here's a great example. In that interview, we talked about his partnership with Origin. They're friends of mine, partners of, of us. Like I train jujitsu with them every week, good personal friends. Well, Cam was presented with an opportunity uh, to develop a brand new hunt line with Origin. Now, if you would have asked Cam about that a year or two ago, that probably wouldn't have even been on his radar. And I think that's what he's saying. He's like, I don't know. Like I, I could get... You know, here's an example with me is there's a possibility at some point in the future that I could get involved politically. And like, what kind of window is that going to open up for me? Well, I don't know. I just want to make sure the window's open if I decide to go through the window or the door. Yeah. And I think that's what Cam was saying. He's like, he's going to work hard. He's going to be diligent. He's going to hold to his values. He's going to be disciplined. He's going to be aspirational towards the things that are important to him. And then he's just going to let the chips fall where they may. And as opportunities present themselves, then he'll be in the position to capitalize on them. So I, that's the way that I interpreted it just in meeting him. And, and I've known Cam for four or five years now. Uh, and, and that's what I gathered. So maybe that gives some additional context. Yeah. You're a good example of this, you know, over the years that, you know, we've had many conversations and you have a tendency, you've, you've used that same exact phrase that Haynes used, right. Of like, well, just focus on the moment and see what next. And, you know, because you would, you'd use an analogies of where's order of man, where it's iron council. And, and what I really like about it is I think it addresses what most of us probably struggle with. And, and, well, I, I don't know. I'm now I'm even hesitant saying it, right? It's like, I, I do think some of us don't focus on long-term strategy and goals, but when we do, we have a tendency to just get so locked into the long-term strategy and goal that kind of back to what we we're talking about before we hit record is like opportunities present themselves and it's not aligned with our strategy and we let them pass us by because, well, this is not where I, I wanted to do it this way. And I wanted these things in place first before I executed. And so now I'm going to pass up an opportunity because I'm quote unquote, you know, it's not meeting the expectations that I had. And, yeah, and I think we, I think a lot of us do that. We don't, we don't live in the present enough to take advantage of the opportunities, but in the same breath, I don't know, maybe that isn't, the bigger issue. Maybe the bigger issue is guys aren't planning strategy well enough. I don't know, but I don't think I, at it least is. for me, you don't think it is. Yeah. I don't think it is. I mean, vision's important. We talk a lot about that in the iron council and it is crucial that you have a vision of the way that you're going to show up and the way that you're going to perform. I mean, of course, you're never going to know what's happening in the future, but to have some sort of vision about what kind of person you want to be when those opportunities present themselves is yeah. crucial. That's our vision planning. It's not like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to have a million dollars or whatever. It's like, okay, but yeah, like what kind of person are up? you going to need to be yeah. to have a million dollars? And so we hear that a lot. Guys will say, well, you know, I want to be an ultra successful businessman. Well, what time did you get out of bed today? Um, I don't know, nine o'clock. Okay. Well, what did you eat? I don't know. I didn't really eat very well. And I got drunk the night before and Okay, well, like what phone calls did you make this morning? Uh, I was pretty tired. It's Memorial Day. So I actually just took the day off and I really didn't call anybody or do anything. It's like, okay, well, like stop worrying about the $10 million you want to make and maybe just start focusing on those things. So let me give you another example. I had the opportunity in the past 60 or 90 days to invest in a company. I can't, I got to be a little discreet here, but invest in a company 
And it was a sizable amount. It was more than more money than I've ever invested in my entire life. Uh, I didn't know that opportunity was going to present itself, but I positioned myself for that opportunity if and when it ever arrived. And it may never have arrived. It may never have come, but I wasn't any better off because I was doing the work. And so I had enough money set aside for when that opportunity presented itself to be able to write that check, which was really, really scary and say, here you go. I believe in you and your company. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. But that opportunity, it, two things, it has to present itself and you have to be ready for it. Now, some people say whether or not it presents itself is out of your hands. That's not true either. I put myself in situations yeah. to be able to capitalize and create opportunities that would never be there otherwise. So the opportunity, put yourself in the position for the opportunity and then make sure you're in the position to actually capitalize on it. And in this case, I was not in all cases, but in this case I was, and that's because I just did good work and followed basic economic principles for what, two decades now. Like, of yeah. course it's going to happen. You know, and people are like, well, I just, you know, I want to make a million dollars. I'm like, well, how much debt do you have? How much money do you spend a day? Do you even know how much debt you have? How much are you paying in taxes? How, how do you reduce your taxation? How do you manage debt? How do you pay it off? How do you stay out of it? Where are you investing? Where are you liquid? Where are you taking risk? Where are you being safe? And people can't even answer these questions. And it's like, okay, do that. And then know that in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, all of a sudden you're going to look back and say, damn, I can take advantage of this opportunity. Right. You wouldn't know it existed, but you created it because you put yourself in the right position. Totally. Or, well, and why do you even want to make a million? Like, yeah, why, why? is that? Why? Yeah, because a lot of people are like, oh, because I want the ability to fly whenever I want. Oh, so you need freedom and flexibility. Right. That may not be a million dollars. Like you could probably pull that <laughs> off <laughs> really quick. Or it might be a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, it, it's a it's a prime example, you know, and I've had this, I I've had an opportunity where and Asia brings this up every so often to remind me. Um, but we we came back from New York and I had a, a good friend of mine ping me and says, Hey, I have this business idea. I want you on board. I can't see it working without you. It would require sweat equity and you not working. And you just living off your savings and just heads down with me at least for six to 12 months. And I was just like, yeah, I can't do it, man. I'm not in a position to do it at the time. That company that he proceeded forward with without me is meta blew out, <laughs> blew out his expectations of how much we would make. I mean, it was substantial, like yeah. substantial. Right. And, um, just wasn't in a position to take advantage of it. Yeah. You know, and it's just like you positioned yourself damn. in the right place, but weren't quite ready yeah. financially yeah. for that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, let that be I a just, lesson. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I'm just saying, let that be a lesson. Like do what's right. Just do what's right. And everybody knows I don't need to tell you hmm. what you should be doing. Like what's the number one thing you already know. Yeah. You know how to kill it today. Yeah. You know, Get out of bed on time, eat correctly, make some phone calls, send some emails, don't waste time on social media. Like you are, save some money, pay off debt, don't incur new debt. You already know everything. Just yeah. do that forever. Forever. That's it. You got it. That's that's all you need is forever. Just do it forever. That's why when I see guys like Jocko where he gets up at 4.30 a.m. I don't get up at 4.30 a.m. because I don't want to get up at 4.30 a.m. I get up about 6, 6.30 every morning. Okay, I, Unless I'm going to train earlier than I would. But for the most part, that's about where I'm at. But the thing about what he's teaching is just do it. it. Yeah. Forever. For no other reason than to do it. Like, what's Jocko working towards when he's doing deadlifts or pull-ups? I don't know. Nothing. He's showing up. He's just right. showing up and getting after it. That's what he's doing. Yeah. What's Cam doing when he literally runs a marathon every morning before his nine to five job? What, it, what is he preparing for? Well, I want to be a good hunter. <laughs> well, you're already a great hunter, brother. Like what else? He's like, that's it. So what is he preparing for? He's just doing it. That's all he's doing. Yeah. yeah. Greg Ray. 
I'm close to freeing up traveling as much as I do with my business, allowing me more time at home. I want to be more involved in my community where it is a good place to start. Our community is just over a hundred thousand. Yeah. A hundred thousand. I, I mean, I would consider that I mean, it's not nearly as small as where I am, but I'd still consider a, a hundred thousand people, a pretty smallish community where you can know a lot of people and there's a lot right. of opportunities to get involved. Uh, I would start with where kids are. And um, mm. I, Greg, I can't remember if you have, I think you have one or two, maybe at home still. I can't, I should know that. I'm sorry, man. But you might have one or two still at home, uh, but start there, right? Because we got we to gotta work in our spheres of influence where we have the most impact because we, don't, we only have so much time. Our resources are finite. So if you're going to exert yourself, you need to be able to put it where it has the greatest impact. And that's within the walls of your home. And then yeah. from there, it starts to spread out to your friends, friends, and then your community members, and then the state, and then governmental, and then worldwide and global, right? But you got to start with your energy being directed where it will have the single greatest impact, and that's within the walls of your home. From there, what I would do, email, email's blowing you up, Kip. I have no idea where that sound is coming from. <laughs> that's what I know. I hear it too. I like, like, I like check my phone. I'm like, it's not my phone. So the angels like, are ready to talk with you and, and yeah. you know, speak down from high. Translations are in, in process. Hold tight. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, it's, it's good. It's just funny. So uh, I would start at the community center and I would go over there and I would say, hey, here's what I'm good at. Mm. And you're great, Greg, you're, you're a hunter. And so do you think that maybe there's, young men and young women in your community who would like to take a hunter's course, who would like to learn how to, he's also great at uh, long range rifle marksmanship. Do you think that there's probably people in your community who would like to know that? Do you think that maybe you could go down to the police force and say, Hey guys, um, here's my training. Here's my experience. Here's my expertise. Here's the schools I have access to. Here's the people I have access to. I would love to train your, your best shooters. Maybe you want to have a marksmanship guy. You want to have a sniper, Uh, go to SWAT. Hey, maybe they need some additional training and you need a resource. Here's something I have. Like start with where you are and what you have and what you have access to, and then figure out how you can start to backfill that serving police officers. um, I I have a heart for young men. I really want to serve young men in the community. That's very important to me. And so we would do all sorts of things from uh, jujitsu is a great thing. Like I could call up Pete today and say, Hey man, like I've got five young men in the, in the neighborhood. Dads are kind of like mixed here and there. Um, do you think I could just borrow your gym once or twice this month? And I'm just going to ha- teach these boys some basics. you would be like, yeah, of course, of course you can do that. In fact, I'm doing it with the barn. I'm putting mats in our barn, that third deck of the barn mats up there yeah. because I, that's where I, that's where I'm good. I have the tools and resource to do it. I'm also really good at networking with other people. So if I don't know how to do it, I've got an expert who I could call probably today. If you were to say, Hey, who can you talk to about video editing that they could teach a course after school? Who could you talk to about teaching martial arts? Who could you talk to about pistol or rifle marksmanship? I have all of, I have access to all of that. And all we have to do is open up what we have, look for creative ways, and then just ask and look for where we can serve within our communities. But they're there police departments, firefighters, young men, young women, community center, plenty of coaching opportunities. If you go to your community center or even your high school, look, go to your high school. Like like football is going to be starting in the fall. We're in summer break pretty much for the most part right now. But you find out who your football coach is and go and just call him and say, hey, you know, I would like to come help you coach. Um, I don't really know much about football, but I can be a warm body out there and I can help help hold these young men accountable. And that coach can be like, yeah, you're in hundred percent. You're in. And you know, you're not going to be the offensive or defensive coordinator, but you can go hold a bag for a kid. I think you can do that. So there's so many opportunities. If you look for the resources and the skills that you have, and then find creative ways to plug them in where you can. I like it. All right, Ron, Christopher, what is the most common and frequent temptation that causes men to break integrity? How best to get back on track? I'm hesitant to say it's this one thing. Yeah. Do you think there's one thing that you would say? I can't really think. I mean, it could be lust. It could be alcohol addiction, um, gambling, 
che- cheating, whether that's on your spouse or just cheating yourself and other people, lying, stealing. Yeah. I don't know if I there's mean, just one temptation. I, Everybody's I so different. A, yeah. I have a thought. I, I think it's just the temptation to be, well, it, it's the temptation of hiding. <laughs> like all those, all the things that we're not proud of are things that, that we want to hide right. That we there, that there's an element of smoke and mirrors, you know, it's like for me to justify doing something that I know is out of integrity. Uh, and I, I, I need to hide it. Right. Cause I'm out of integrity and I have to justify it. And so maybe that's the temptation, right. To, to not Good. be not showing up in life in a way that like, you can't just be yourself and, and, and let people know who you are and that there's not this altered version that you keep private because you're out of integrity and you would be shameful if, if people ever found out. That's really good. Yeah. I've got friends in my life. One Sean Whalen, who, who always talks about it in the context of telling the truth and, and you have to tell the truth. Like if you're looking at your waistline, yeah. it's a little bigger than you think. Well, you have to tell the truth about that. Don't just yeah. suck your gut in, like tell the truth. You're overweight. You're not eating correctly. Or if you're up to date, up to your eyeballs in debt, like tell the truth about it. Stop lying to yourself about it. Stop lying to yourself. I think that's really good. I think that's really good. The second part of Ron's question was how how do you, what do you do about it? On track. Yeah. The best thing that you could do is figure out what your specific temptation is. Maybe it's debt, maybe it's cheating, maybe it's lying, whatever mediocrity. And then whatever it is, put systems in place to refrain from those behaviors. So for example, if you're a raging alcoholic, probably not a good idea to have a bunch of booze in the house. Yeah. Like it's just probably not. If there's a liquor store near you, it's or a convenience store where you usually go pick up a six pack or a 12 pack or a 24 pack, probably just say, I'm not going to that store anymore. But Ryan, I have to get gas. Okay. Make a contract, go get gas across town. Like for whatever reason, that's the problem. So remove that problem from your life. If it's women, I have some, some, some people I know personally who have a hard time with womanizing. And so guys, don't put yourself in that situation. I had a young woman reach out to me years and years ago, and she was a friend uh, in, in a business setting. She, we were friendly that way. And she wanted to um, learn more about order of man and what we were doing because she wanted to start something similar. And I, I think that she had, if I remember, this was years and years ago, she had asked if she could come over to the house and talk with me about all of this stuff. And I said, no, you definitely cannot do that. Because, and it, you know, guys will say, well, then you're weak or then there must be an issue. There might be, and I am weak, a hundred percent. I'm weak. Yeah. And so there may not, it may have not been a big deal at all. You know, my wife happened to be out of town. I think if I remember correctly that week and I'm like, Nope, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I don't go out with, with women, even business colleagues and professionals. I don't, I don't do that because I'm not going to put myself in that situation. I'm not tempted by that personally but why am I going to flirt with the devil? What, what, yeah. what, what, what positive benefit would come from putting myself in compromising situations? So put up your barriers, put up your boundaries, figure out where your temptations are, put processes and systems in place, have people that you're accountable to. Maybe that's your wife. Maybe that's a friend. If, if you're tempted at all, you better have a 911 number. So like Kip, for example, if I'm, um, you know, if I love to get drunk and just go gamble or something, I, I feel like I could probably, if I was in a bad way, call you up and be like, Kip, I'm really tempted, man. Like, can I come over and like, can we, whatever, like watch the fights or can we go train or can, can we just have a barbecue tonight? And you would be all over that a hundred percent. That's a system that you can, that's a little 911 numbers. Like, oh shit. Call Kip. Yep. This is why AA works actually is you have those accountabilities, like call Kip. I'm in trouble. 
and they, they will help you. And if you don't have anybody like that in your corner, you better have somebody like that in your corner. Yeah. And, and I would argue that most guys probably have someone in their corner. They just don't think they have someone like that in their corner or, or they're, they're afraid to call to make the and call yeah. because I think highly of you Kip and I want, and I actually, I want you to think mm. highly of me. I see. Yeah. And so if I, if and you're I'm more like, concerned about what I might think then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I want to maintain that facade that comes back to what you said about lying. So I want to maintain that facade. So I'm like, man, Kip could really help me, but I can't call him because if mm. I do, he's going to think less of me. Okay. Well then that's not as good as a relationship as you thought it was or you're not as good as a, of a partner in this context as you should be. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And also you should be holding people accountable, right? So like if, if Kip, I see you doing something, you've never told me this directly, yeah. but if I see you doing something that I don't think is in your best interest, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Or at and least I I'm going to bring it up. I would be like, Hey Kip, like you really seem like you've been off for a week. Like I, I got to ask what's going, like, I'm genuinely interested. What's going on? Like, what do I need to do to help you? And you should yeah. do that. If you're a friend of somebody, you should absolutely do that. Yeah, for sure. I think some guys might be in a position, Ryan, where they know they should stop doing something. Let, let, let's just use the alcohol as an example. They, they know it's not an ideal thing. They should probably quit, but, but it's loose. Like it's not strong enough to know, like they haven't come to the point, like this is a problem, but they're out of integrity for doing it anyway, because there's this little bit of, I know I shouldn't kind of thing. How do you get to the point from your perspective of like, Hey, that I got to stop. How, how do I get to the point of getting the clarity needed to know that like, I need to take a step here and I need to make some major adjustments. I don't know, man. I, I really don't. It's, I think it's the little innocuous things that are the hardest. Mm. The ones that are easily justified and they're just part yeah. of our day to day. It's yeah. because it just doesn't seem wrong, you know, yeah. or you haven't made it wrong and you're like, Oh, you know, one drink won't hurt. Now, some of you guys might, that might be your issue. And then it's like, yeah, but I would never step out on my wife. Yeah. Because it's more, it's, it's bigger to you. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's, of course, you're not going to do that. I would never, you know, commit, a, I would never commit this crime. Right. Because that's part of your value system. And you real like, that's easy. Totally. It's the little stuff. That's the, it's like the flirting with, you know, the cashier at the convenience store. You're like, what's the problem? Well, there's yeah. no problem. Just flirting with her. Yeah. You know, it's that, it's that one drink. It's that one pull of lever. If you're gambling, it's the, it's the one time you, you know, forge somebody's signature on a document. It's like the one little, it's like, no, I'm doing what's in their best interest. It's compromising. It's com yeah. And it's just chipping away, just gradually, just chip, 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 chip. And before you know it, you do something that's catastrophic. So yeah. to your point, your question, what can you do? Maybe realize the severity of it. Maybe make it more severe than you think and really hold that to a high standard. It's like, no, I'm not going to have one drink. I don't have any drinks. Like, that's just my standard. Right. And so that's what you do. I don't know. I wish I could tell you because yeah. there's things I struggle and am tempted by, and it's, it's hard, man. It really is. I wish I had a better answer than that. When I, when my teenage boys used to mess up, I used usually like pull out the whiteboard and I'd draw this, you know, this projection you know, it's like the probable future projection. It's like, okay, well, at this age, if you make these decisions, what's, what's the next probable decision you'll make that's align that same path? Will you justify this maybe just a little bit incrementally worse mm -hmm. than the decision you just made? And what's the net, next increment of beyond that? And, and ultimately the conversation of, you know, what's the probable future if you don't change? And, and I do think that's valuable, especially for, you know, it's easier conversation to be had when we talk about fitness, right? It's like, okay, what's the probable future that you don't start eating healthy? Well, that's easy to calculate. The probable future is, is that uh, you're going to end up 50 pounds overweight. And then, the, and then the second question is, is what's the impact of that? And I think that's where we sometimes get a little loose where we might go, well, the impact is, you know, uh, I'll be fat and, uh, 
not be able to run and I, a bad self image of myself and maybe I, you know, my sex life decreases, but yeah, it's been decreasing anyway. So it's not, I a don't big think, deal. I actually don't think, I think what they say is they don't let's just take go it, there. No, they don't even, I don't go there. Oh, see, like, I, do you like, well, here's I, what I do. those are my soft ones, right? Well, I, I was going to eventually end up with the probable future. The impact is the fact that your kids start eating unhealthy as well. And they start getting bullied at school. They're not proud of their bodies. That's the, I mean, there's the big impact that usually drives people to cause I mean, better look, behavior, but I don't disagree with what you're saying. I a hundred percent agree that your decisions today are going to lead to legacy type decisions and impacts hundred yeah. percent. I don't think people, when they go have a donut at Duncan on Saturday, that they're like, well, you know, if I eat this, then my kids are going to get bullied and they might end up killing themselves. <laughs> that's, that's the problem is yeah. that we don't do what you're saying is like, we're like, yeah. it's just a donut. Relax. It's one donut. Well, yeah. if you're anything like me, I don't eat one donut. I eat yeah, all either. the donuts. <laughs> Okay. It's, it's the same with drinking. Like I, I, it's like, if you want to put a drink in my face, like I, if I have one, I'll have all the drinks on the t- everywhere. I'll have all of it. Cause that's yeah. my personality. So like, I just, I don't want to do that because I know where it goes. I know where it leads, but I think a lot of us don't think about the direction, the trajectory, the inevitable outcome of that. Cause we just think it's just a donut, big deal. Loosen up, enjoy life. You should enjoy life we're going to die. Like you should just enjoy it while we're here. Eat, drink, be merry. Yeah. Which goes back to what you're saying, you know, in the example of Jocko, like what does Jocko do what Jocko does? Cause that's who he is. And, and, and when you have that perspective of being, then it's not just a donut. Yeah. It's actually a reflection of your character and how you acted today. And did you show up in a very powerful way? It's more about that than it is anything else. You know what is interesting about a lot of these guys, and I've been so fortunate to be able to talk with some high-achieving men, Jocko being one of them, um, the other two that come to mind, Cam Haynes, since we talked about him earlier, and another one is Tim Kennedy. I'll know this. Andy Frasilla would probably echo a similar statement. Know this. All four of those gentlemen know how weak they are. I, you need to know that. Because you're looking at him, you're like, oh, he's so disciplined. Yeah, discipline isn't like a, it isn't a state of being it's a, it's a it's an activity it's a it's a, a habit it's in spite of the weakness yeah yes all of those guys know their weaknesses and limitations tim kennedy the other day i sat down with him that podcast is coming out i think uh next week and he's he said to me he's like man because i was asking about how active he is he's like i have to because if i don't i'll do something really really horrible Cause he knows, like he just knows. So he's like, I gotta be active. I gotta have the schedule. I gotta be disciplined. I gotta have this process in place. All four of those guys and countless, countless others have told me how weak they are. And because they know what they do when they don't have these systems in place, they put the systems in place and everybody's like, well, you're weak. If you need a system, some of the, the, what you would consider are the strongest men on the planet. David Goggins is another one. David's full aware, fully aware of how horrible it could get if he didn't go run and bust his ass every single day the way he does. That's why he does it. Listen yeah. to him. That's why he does it. Jordan totally. Peterson, that's another one. I mean, Jordan had some real health issues years ago, uh, maybe a year or so ago. And like with his personality and the way that he gets in his head and starts thinking about, I don't know him personally. But the way that he starts thinking about things, I can only imagine what depression and anxiety spiral look yeah. like for an individual like that. And so he's got to take this mind, which is his mind, which is so powerful and direct it at something beneficial. Because if he doesn't, he's going to get himself killed. Yeah. Our, our, our strength is our, our weakness and vice versa. Jacob Benda. A forge guy, by the way. Nice. So if you don't know what the forge is, the forge is brand new members from the iron council. They're in the forge for 30 days as they get onboarded and ramped up to become a full fledged member in the iron council. Yeah. So glad you joined us, Jacob. He gives us a quote. Our wives don't start arguments. 
they are sharing their hearts by Reb Bradley. If we met, if we as men can have the mindset when communicating with our wives, not to get defensive, but to listen, understand that she is sharing her fears and concerns in your own experience, thinking back, if you were told this before you got married, would it have helped those first one to five years of marriage? I mean, it's a cute quote. I don't know if it's totally true. Um, cause sometimes I'll, they're look, not so I'll, innocent. <laughs> let me, let me change. I'm just going to change the phrasing. Let's just say you for a man, instead of talking about our wives, cause I don't want to talk about my wife negatively here. So I'll talk about myself <laughs> negatively. If you said, well, men don't start arguments. They share their hearts. I'm like, no, sometimes I just want to watch the freaking world burn. Yeah. I want to argue. Yeah. So I don't know if it's the same for women, but I've had plenty of knock down, drag out fights with my wife about who knows what, and I'm not sure it's her sharing her heart or her just, you know, being pissed or what. And maybe it's semantics. Maybe she's pissed because in her heart, she sees a different, I don't know. I'm just saying like, let's not paint it all as a rosy, fluffy fairy tale. Like, but here's one thing I would say is whether it's from her heart or whether she just wants to watch things burn to the ground. Cause she's PMSing or she's pissed off about something maybe there's some space, some margin in there to back up and try to understand. And I would agree with the rest of your sentiment in this, in this, that if I would have learned that in the first one to five years of just back off Seek to okay? understand, yeah, just what's, what's going on. Okay. She's PMSing. Okay. She's mad about this thing. Okay. She had something happen with the kids and now she's venting on me. Okay. All right. Just back up, figure it out to the, to his point and, yeah, it would have went a whole lot better. A hundred percent. Yeah. I have always, whenever we have like young couples get married and we end up going to a wedding and I'm signing a card, I usually always write something similar to this. And it's, this will be the hardest thing you will ever do in your entire <laughs> life. And it's then true. I put, and then I go, and that's okay. Yeah. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. And, and don't make it wrong that it's hard. And don't get me wrong. Like, should we have ideal marriages? And should we argue of course. for sure? But the best advice I ever got, because by the way, I didn't have this. I remember the first time I got in a fight with my wife, I thought, uh, should we get a divorce? Like, is this normal? Like something's wrong. And I remember calling up my brother saying, she's crazy. <laughs> she's, this, this lady's crazy. This is a disaster, blah, blah, blah. And, he's, and he just starts laughing at me. <laughs> sort of starts laughing. He's like, dude, welcome to marriage, man. Yeah. It's super yeah. tough. Good luck. <laughs> and that was it. I was like, you know what? Okay. Got it. Like don't exit just cause it's getting tough. It's going to be hard. You know, that's the best advice ever. I think. I always advice. think it's, I think it's funny when actually, I think it's funny, but I also think they're full of shit when people are like, I never argue with my wife. <laughs> I yeah, either you're think, just stonewalling her then. <laughs> I, I mean, at the risk of being morbid, maybe it's because you know you lost your wife five years ago in an accident or something, and that's why you don't argue with her anymore. Because outside of that, there's yeah. no escaping it. I guess at least totally. in my perspective, I don't know. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, like it's part of the deal. If somebody said they're not arguing with their wife, I'd be like, okay, well, one of you isn't human then because yeah. or you don't have a strong relationship and you're not engaging or something else is going on or you're or you're a wimp that's another one yeah there's yeah. a lot of times like sometimes women will do what both women and men will do this is they're so passive they allow themselves to be abused like yeah. emotionally verbally mentally abused because they're so afraid of conflict that whenever somebody says something contrary to what they want or what they believe, they're like, okay, hon, whatever that, yes, we can do that. And it's like, well, you didn't want to do that. I know, but you know, it's, she, she wants to do this. I'm like, okay, well, but you don't yeah. need to do all those things just because she wants, you can share your own perspectives and your own thought. And you know what? She would actually probably like that. If you yeah. stepped up to the plate every now and again, like my wife and I will, she's very stubborn as am I. And so but she likes to be stubborn. And so do I. But I like that. I like it. I like that she's not going to roll over and be a wimp. I think that once all the dust is settled, she likes that of me, that I am convicted, that I do believe what I believe, that I am willing to stand up for myself. And I like that she's willing to stand up for herself. And don't get me wrong. I do say I'm sorry. 
because I mess up a lot. And I say, I'm, I go to her and I said, hey, and here's how I apologize. Hey, hon, we had this argument and I was thinking about it more. And I still believe these few things, but some of the things that you shared were right. And I felt like I probably took out some of my frustrations from the day on you. And I'm genuinely sorry about that. I should not have done that. I should have talked with you in a different way. So I'm very specific when I apologize and I'm very genuine yeah. about what I am sorry about. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, usually Asia and I, it's usually, uh, you are a complete bitch. And she goes, I told you I was one before we got married. And then that's it. <laughs> it's like, you still like, sign. She, she was yeah, straight up with you. She was. And she actually did say that to me. She's like, just so you know. And I'm like, okay, I still love you, whatever. And then the first time we got to fight, she's like, I told you. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> You're like, okay. Disclaimer so, whenever you yeah. want. <laughs> it's like, so what? You're allowed to be that way now because you told me? Come on now. Kip, if you want me to Super call her up and, and talk with her, <laughs> too bad. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I was going to say, good luck. <laughs> All right. We got one more question from the IC. Uh, so Chris uh, Silvestri, <laughs> my friend wants to know, he says, what's a good testosterone booster to keep the libido going? <laughs> I'm not sure if he's joking or if he's serious question. Do you even have any resource? Do you know? I mean, there's, there's replacement therapy. There's yeah. other, there's other, I actually, so there's like vitamins and things and supplements there. I would say vi vitamins are probably good because that's a nutritional thing. So yeah. the low hanging fruit before you get to like replacement therapy, and I'm not saying you should not do that, but, uh, losing weight will definitely help. Not only will you have more energy, you'll feel better about yourself. So you'll build confidence and you'll look better naked. So she'll be more att attracted to you. So losing yeah. weight, um, eating correctly, exercising and getting the right amount of sleep. Sleep is something a lot, sleep probably way too many men overlook getting enough water, ditching the booze, uh, eating meat, protein is very important. And then one that a lot of guys overlook is doing what I, what I would just say, doing manly things, spending time a with other men competing with them and winning. There has been yeah. studies that have shown that when you compete with another man and you win your testosterone levels spike, when you compete with another man and you lose, they actually decline just based on competition. So get better and beat other men at things and your testosterone will boost. Uh, and then I would also encourage all of those things in her because if she's losing weight and she's getting sleep and she's not, I think stress is probably a bigger issue for her. It's also an issue for us, cortisol levels. But if she's getting all those things, she's going to have the energy. She's also going to look more attractive to you. Also ditch the porn, stop beating off. That's going to help a lot of different things that you can do that are going to, yeah. are going to help boost the libido for you. And we all know what they are. We all know what yeah. they are. And there's a lot of diet stuff that you can look into. I mean, a lot of frozen foods, for instance, have tons of estrogen in them. So it's like, look at what kind of food you're eating that may not necessarily give you testosterone, but might be affecting your testosterone in a negative way. So I'm not a, I'm not an expert on this, but I have, I've read a lot about it and studied up on it. So we have, um, these, these, again, some of you guys are going to roll your eyes when I say this, cause I'm not using the correct terminology, but I think you'll get the point. We have endocrine disruptors. So we have the endocrine system within our bodies and the disruptors, um, are what inhibit the testosterone from binding with the molecules of our bodies. You need that. You need testosterone to bind. And if you have an endocrine disruptor, then the testosterone that your body's producing or being introduced to your body will not bind correctly. And therefore it won't be absorbed into the system and then does what it does. But if you look at the, like you said, the foods that we eat, the products that we use, you look at uh, soap, for example, uh, or ha like hair gel and hairspray and, and uh, shampoo, toothpaste, you put water in plastic cups, everything's in plastic they all have endocrine disruptors that are keeping testosterone from binding to your system and producing the desired effect. There's a great book called master your T by Christopher Walker. I believe Christopher Walker, master your T it's, it's a bit of a textbook kind of read, but very, very insightful about what's going on. Cool. All right, let's wrap it up.
All right. So we have a couple call to actions, but I think the key things is store.order of man is uh, still open. If you guys want to order some equipment um, or some gear and whatnot, whether it's be battle planners, t-shirts, hats, and et cetera. Um, and of course, connect with Mr. Mickler on Instagram and Twitter at Ryan Mickler. And then the Iron Council that's opening up in 15 days. So be prepared. Uh, that will only be open for a few weeks and it's going to close right back up until next quarter. So you guys need to act if you want to join us within the IEC and then band with us. You know, we had a couple of questions about communities, facebook.com slash group slash order of man uh, to connect with us on Facebook and to rub shoulders with other like-minded men. That's it. Well done. All right, guys, we'll be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.